Well, it's good to be able to speak to you again. I'm quite enjoying these times of speaking through the television. And um, I want to take a specific text for today. And it's one that's one of my favorite verses in the Bible, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, where Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God unto salvation to those who believe. But I want to look at it in a completely different way today because what I'm really concerned is this, that to me, the power in my ministry, the anointing, the miracles, and as you know, there are so many of them, are actually related to my preaching the gospel. Because I find two things. One is that most miracles seem to occur when I'm preaching the gospel in evangelism. And secondly, that I see them as a confirmation of the gospel I preach. And um, uh, it, 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 it's quite interesting because even when I was in the prison, one reason why I was seeking the Lord for my release on a specific time was because preaching the gospel there without a Bible, of course, at the beginning, and with little evidence, ultimately the proof, the test of the gospel that I preached in the prison was the miracle of my release. And when we're looking at the church today, and for us here in, in, in England, we, we're going to come out and in a few days be released from all the effects of the COVID restrictions, but that's not happening in many other countries in the world. But what I'm looking at is, and I can't get away from uh, the fact that my Bible is open at uh, Numbers chapter 13 and 14, where suddenly you realize that uh, when Moses sent out the 12 spies eh, to spy out the land and they came back, 10 were full of rebuke, condemnation, looking at the problems, looking at the difficulties and saying it's impossible, we can't do it. Only two, Joshua and Caleb, actually spoke powerfully and prophetically and said, God is with us, nothing is impossible. But the result is, and you find this, and, and I'm a little bit disturbed in reading Numbers 13 and 14 because it says, I mean, in chapter 14, the congregation lifted up the voice and, and cried, and the people wept all night. Why? Because God is saying, because of the lack of faith and the false report, that whole generation, 40 years, were to die in the wilderness. And, you know, I'm very concerned about the situation with the church today. Now, look, I'm not condemning the church, and I'm not relating to the whole church, but let's look at what the world sees as the church. And to me, that, unfortunately, is a critical issue. And today what we're finding is that the church is moving so far away from biblical standards I, I'm disturbed because I've only read in recent days that the Methodist Church, for example, is going to accept um, homosexual marriage and the, the acceptance of LGBTs into the church and so on. Now, I've nothing against accepting everybody into the church because <laughs> I never forget seeing a poster outside a church once when I was walking uh, through a city centre and it was quite striking because the, the, the poster said, this church is for sinners only. And you know, that's absolutely true. 
The church is for the sinner. I was a sinner. Come on. I was a sinner without Christ. I, I had no way into the kingdom of God. And many of you know my testimony that the reason I accepted Christ as a, an eight-year-old was because, yeah, uh, my I, my parents were Christian and we were away at a convention. My father was preaching at the convention and there was also a young evangelist there. And something that the young evangelist had said had caused us to raise our hands and indicated that we wanted to receive Christ. And so that night when we got back to the house where we were staying, my parents and the two of us boys, um, my father turned to my uh, twin brother, who's always said he's older than me, of course, and that's always been a major issue. <laughs> and so my father turned to my brother first and said, well, do you want to accept uh, Jesus? And my brother said, yes. And so my father counseled him, spoke with him and prayed with him. And that was that. But then my father looked at me uh, the younger one, and said, now, do you want to do the same? Do you want to accept Jesus like your brother? And I'll probably shock you when I tell you, my blunt answer was no. <laughs> and in this talking with people recently, they're quite shocked to realize that my, my answer was no. I said, I'm not ready, and I, 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 I couldn't even understand why, if I'd raised my hand, why. I had no recollection, actually, of doing it. But the strange thing was this. Um, sleeping in that house that night, my brother and I, of course, as twins, we were sharing a bed. We were only eight. And um, I couldn't sleep. And I can remember, I was lying in bed and I was so convicted because already, uh, because I mean, I've grown up in a preacher's sermon and listened to more messages than you have, <laughs> even by the time I was eight. <laughs> I knew that if Christ were to return that night, that my brother, my parents would go to be with the Lord and I would be left. I wouldn't go and I would go to hell. And as an eight-year-old, I was so afraid of the fear of a Christless eternity that I got out of my bed and made my peace with the Lord and said, Lord, I want you to come into my life. I, I, I need you. And uh, Okay. But the interesting thing is that I got up the next morning and my, uh, my brother never, ever commented from that day on what happened. But I know I got up the next morning and uh, I, it was in Bournemouth, actually, and I looked out of the window and the sky was a brighter blue. The flowers were a deeper hue, the color, even the birds sang more sweetly. <laughs> it was a long time before I put it together properly and I realized it wasn't the world that had changed, but I had changed. And you know, when people wonder why I'm an evangelist, it's not simply because God called me as an evangelist. I, I don't specifically remember that. But it was because my whole understanding of that moment was without Christ, there was no eternity. And so that's always been with me. And that's why I preach the gospel with some intensity, because unless you receive Christ and the forgiveness of sin, Jesus said, unless you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom. Now, it's not just that, but what I'm concerned at the moment is how far the Orthodox Church, the regular church, is slipping from biblical standards. Now, this concerns me because I believe it, it's in a, a very dangerous and a difficult situation because the scripture is absolutely clear in Revelation. The, the, the word for, strongly from Revelation is this, you cannot add to the scripture you cannot take away from the scripture because if you take away from the scripture, your name is taken out of the book of life. And if you add to the scripture, all the plagues. Oh, come on. 
we've got to get back to this biblical standard. And you know, when calling all the different um, church denominations to prayer in, 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 in the Ukraine, and people have questioned, well, how can you get? I, I don't agree with the dogmas, the doctrines of many of the churches that join with us. But right from the beginning, the Holy Spirit really put in my spirit, look, when you meet with the, the heads, the archbishops, the bishops, or whoever, put this to them, we can only stand together in prayer and unite if we agree two things. One, that the only authority in the church is the Bible, the Word of God. And secondly, salvation is only in the name of Jesus. And it's quite a miracle that every single of those denominations that join with us in Ukraine do so on that basis. And yet the strange thing is this, I can't get that kind of an agreement even here in Britain. Because when I say we have to accept that the Bible is the only authority, if you accept the authority of the Bible, you have to accept one thing is we didn't evolve from the dust. And as I sometimes say to people, <laughs> my great-great-grandfather <laughs> wasn't an amoeba or some unicellular thing, nor was it a monkey, you know, I was created, all my, all my ancestors were created in the image of God. Which brings me to the other thing, that when God created, he created male and female for a specific purpose. Not only men and women, but in the, in the birds and the beasts, simply for procreation that we would multiply and fill the earth. That's why I cannot accept gender change. Because, well, even a lot of women are coming against it because you, you are what you are physically when you're born. And I'm sorry, but no amount of operations, and I, I'm sad because some men have had significant operations, and of course they, re they repent and reject it later because they've lost their manhood. But look, God made us in his image, but he made us male and female. But why am I doing this and relating it to Numbers 13 and 14? You see, the whole thing with, with Israel is that they had slipped so far from their original calling and belief and standing, so that ultimately, here what we're reading is this, out of the million by then, two million, three million, four million, whatever, that the only two that were going to go into the promised land, even Moses didn't, but that wasn't for the same reason, that was for a different reason, but it's interesting if you look, and I want you to look at some of these verses, because the, in, in chapter 14, the people wept that night, and all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and there and the whole congregation, would to God we died in the land of Egypt, or, we, or would God we died in the wilderness? Why? Because they said, why has the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Isn't it better? to go back into Egypt. You see, the danger is, the church is in the danger of going back into Egypt. Somebody said, and there's a very wise statement, it was easier to get Israel out of Egypt than to get Egypt out of Israel. Do you understand? It's easier for us to come into a salvation, but we have to get rid of that old life, that old character, that old nature. And I, I, I can't get away from the fact that ultimately here 
it, it, it's, I mean, the nation is weeping. And when I look at our nation today and I see how far Christian standards have slipped. And, you know, I, I'm always reminded of how my father taught me as a boy. And he taught me about in relationships. And, and he told me the story of a, of, of a girl and a girl in the church. It wasn't my father's church. This was an illustration. He spoke about a, 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 a girl in the church and she went to her pastor and she said, Pastor, I'm, I, I'm going to get married. I, I, I love this boy. But he's not a believer. He's not a member of the church. But she said to the pastor, look, when I marry him, I'll change him. Oh, famous last words of every woman who think they're going to change the man by marrying him. <laughs> but the pastor just looked at the girl and said, look. And he said, um, stand on that table. And the girl stood on the table. And then he said, now reach out your hand and pull me up onto the table. Well, she tried and she tried, and of course she couldn't. Eventually, uh, the pastor pulled her down. And he said, look, it's so much easier to bring people down than lift them up. And, you know, the danger in the church is that in order to try to reach the world... And when I look at the motivation behind the dropping of biblical standards, whether it's with marriage and, and a thousand other things, when I see that the motive behind it is to try to come down to the level of the world. But the moment you come down to their level, you'll never lift them up to yours or God's standard. Do you understand? And until we return to a strong biblical faith, a strong Christian principle, we will not change the world. And, and it concerns me because as we're coming out of the pandemic, I, I, I can see that there are a number of messages. I've had some about um, getting together to discuss how the church is going to react as we come out of the pandemic. and so. But all I would say is this, don't Drop your standard. Look, either the Bible is the only authority in the church or it's not. And if it is the authority, you have to keep the words of the book. And I, I, I can't get away from this. You see, not only that, but I was talking a few days ago with some Christians about uh, the problem that um, one pastor wrote to me and he said, David, he said, look, I, 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 I appreciate your ministry and healing and so on, and I, 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 I want some advice. And I said to him, well, the best thing you can do is I'm not going to write to you. Talk to me on the phone or we meet. Because what he said was this, today, so many people are saying the miracles in the Bible, the healing, even the baptism of the Holy Spirit, only applied 2,000 years ago. And that what happened in the Bible is only for the biblical era and doesn't relate to today. And the church is, and this is why I started with that first scripture, where in Romans 1.16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, because in that gospel is all the power of God revealed. And what we've got to get back to is a gospel that has power to change men. And yes, part of it is the infilling of the Holy Spirit. You've only got to read the Acts of the Apostles. It's also the continuing of the miracles because Jesus said to his disciples who lived beyond the biblical place and period and time, said to them, go into the world, preach the gospel, heal the sick, raise the dead. So in other words, Jesus expected the miraculous. Uh-oh, did you hear what I said? Jesus expected the miraculous to continue after his death and outside the biblical period. And what I often try and say to people is this, 
there's one only one unfinished book in the Bible. I mean, there's a lot of unfulfilled prophecies yet, I know, but there's, there's one book, and it's the Acts of the Apostles. Because the Acts of the Apostles were simply the record of what they did after Jesus had gone. You've got, I mean, how can you read the Acts of the Apostles without realizing it was a record of the early church? And we still live in that same period, I believe, that the church dispensation was from the 50th day after the crucifixion, the day of Pentecost, right up till now. And that church, we're in the church dispensation. Come on, can you argue against that? Well, if we are in the church dispensation, then what happened in the Acts of the Apostles should happen today. <laughs> I suppose I'm slightly unusual in it growing up with the background I did. I always knew that. I never questioned it, and I expected to see it. And, of course, I was living in an age when the people around me also believed it, and so we saw the miracles. And my people say, when did the miracles start? Well, the miracles started right from the beginning of my ministry. I, I can remember, I mean, I planted the church here in Dewsbury. But we still have the newspaper cuttings from 1959, November 1959, which spoke of the hall being filled, the preacher preaching, praying with the sick, and the miracles they recorded, the blind eyes were opened and the cripples walked. You see, that was the demonstration. And I always remember when I started to work in recent years with the, with the Israelis, when, when I found out that I was expected to speak to the Holocaust survivors, I, 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 was, I was crying out to God, look, how can I talk to these people? Because we, we worship the Jewish God. And these people, because of their faith in God, went through the gas chambers, the furnaces, and died. How can I tell them that that God is a God of love? Do you know what they said to me? They said, these are Russian Jews. They said, we will listen to you, David, and you can preach from your Bible, and you can speak with us on this condition, that if your Jesus is the Messiah, if your Jesus is the Son of God, and if he is alive, then we would expect to see the same miracles today. And the amazing thing is, those miracles happened. And when I spoke to them afterwards, I said, well, did you see that? Oh, far more than we expected. And one of the most precious things in my office is uh, where they sent me a large picture of the people, some of the people who died in the Holocaust, and they had superimposed on top of it people miraculously healed. You see, there was the evidence. And what we need today as we face an uncertain and an unbelieving world, we need the evidence. You know, that's, that's why when I had the lung cancer, you know the story. I said to the Lord, Lord, I cannot go back into Russia and preach this gospel from this book if I've had chemotherapy or I've had my lung removed. I said, I have to be the witness of your power. And for that's, that's why God healed me. I, I, I said, literally, I said, I was 70, 71, I think, at the time. And I said, Lord, if I'm too old, if you don't, can you imagine that 71 and I'm saying, Lord, if I'm too old, if you don't need me anymore, I've got no work to do down here. I said, let me go home, but take me quickly. <laughs> but I said, Lord, if you want me to go back into Russia, then you've got to work the miracle. God worked the miracle, as you know. And I would suggest that the biggest miracles came after 2003. You see, that is the evidence Come on, let's get back to the authority of the Word of God. 
we have no other foundation. If you build a church on any other foundation than the authority of the Word of God, you're building it on sinking sand. But we, as the Word says, are built on the rock, which is Christ Jesus. God bless you. Let me pray. Father, I just pray that you will open people's hearts and their minds, that their faith will be on the accuracy and truth of your word. Oh God, we need to build on that rock, which is Christ. Amen. Now, I want to urge you to, to buy the books that I'm writing because it's one of the miracles of the lockdown that I've taken the chance that I never had time to do before, and I'm writing books, but these books are getting more and more powerful. And the strange thing is that God is revealing so much that I never understood before. And look, it's I've got 70 years of ministry packed into my life. Now I need it to explode and I want to pass it on to you what God is showing me. Look, you'll find the books on the website and just send to us and God bless you. Well, I've just been speaking uh, in, in a program that will go out on vision and the need of the world and the need of evangelism. And I can tell you this, I have an enormous vision today of what God needs to do. I mean, we need Jesus now. The whole nation needs Jesus. The whole world needs Jesus. And there are so many other false religions coming, but we can't do it without your support we need the finance. Look, people say, why do you have to pay so much for crusades? And I, one of my answers is this. You can't ask the sinner to pay for his salvation. And we make a principle of never taking up an offering in an evangelistic meeting for fear of criticism from the world that we're only there for the money. It's better to give than to receive. And I'm asking you for your support in Jesus' name. This is Prophetic Vision. It's the most powerful prophetic magazine in Europe today. It's read by almost half a million people in 132 countries around the world. Send for it free and let God show you the path to revival in your life, in your nation.